Welcome to the Sidewalk Weekly Podcast, a show for people who are big on cities but short on time. I am Vanessa Quirk. Eric, um, apparently demand for puzzles is just going through the roof right now. Have you been spending all of your isolation just puzzle doing? The problem with puzzles for me is you got to wipe off each of the pieces individually. <laughs> I think that you're takes taking a this a little time. too far. Uh, the, am the, I? Have, have the puzzles been going for walks outside? <laughs> I don't know where the puzzles have been, and that's the problem. That's that's what's puzzling me. Ah, uh, very nice. <laughs> so with that bad joke in mind, I will welcome all our city lovers. Uh, this is the Sidewalk Weekly. I'm Eric Jaffe. We'll spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the biggest stories from the urban tech world. Our first segment looks at three top stories. We give them five minutes each, and when time's up, you'll hear a little bicycle bell. This week, our top stories discuss the inequity of COVID, an urbanist's guide to the crisis, and the power plant of the future. Okay, let's get started. Let's get started. So we're going to start with equity. Obviously, a huge story that's becoming clearer and clearer this week. A bunch of articles showing that COVID is taking a disproportionate toll on lower income communities, on minority populations. These are folks who, you know, make up a large share of the essential workforce That's keeping our cities and many of our residents alive right now. So, Vanessa, from all these stories, what stuck out to you? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of great stories this week. I think one of the first ones I read was from the New York Times. This was Jennifer Valentino DeVries, Denise Liu, and Gabriel J. X. Dance. So they created a very kind of visually oriented article, and they used smartphone location data just to get a sense of how many people are moving around in the 25 largest U.S. metro areas. And they have these really compelling charts that show how people People in the top percent of the income bracket are moving around far less than those in the bottom 10 percent. And obviously, you know, these are the folks who have to continue to work right now. And we, we've talked about this a little bit in previous episodes about, you know, we have the luxury of being able to work remote and not yeah. everyone can. The healthcare workers, public safety workers, delivery drivers, grocery workers, plumbers, you know, they're keeping the economy kind of on life support right now, but they might not have access to the things that would make them feel safer to be out and about. You know, we've talked about transit workers not having enough access to masks and gloves, grocery workers as well. Often these folks don't have health insurance or can't claim unemployment benefits, uh, especially if they're kind of gig economy workers. The stimulus was a was a needed start to addressing some of these things, but the, the relief is not getting here fast enough and cities and, and people need more right now. They do. We like to offer a tech solution or an innovative solution on this show. That's what we as a company want to put forward. And I'm not going to suggest there is one here right. um, because there, there really may not be. Although I think tech-driven data, digital digital information, it can really hammer home the problem for policymakers. But the policymakers are, are going to be the ones who make a difference here. Um, you know, Maybe data can help them know where to direct further need whether that's hazard pay, health support, but they're the ones who are going to have to pull the trigger on that. This is both a very troubling trend, and unfortunately, it's not a surprising trend because we've seen this across history, right? These are the same disparities that were in place before COVID struck. Frankly, they're the same disparities that were striking in 1918 when I looked at the distinction across cities and the health outcomes. This mattered then too, right? So so we know these things have been problems. It's whether we can muster the the social will to do something about it. And I think what it in part also reflects is this shift away from investment in public health, which helps a large part of the population, and, and this shift toward people handling health on their own personal basis, which is related to healthcare costs, insurance costs. We've seen local health departments really gutted the past few years. They've eliminated jobs, I think something more like 50,000 public health jobs since 2008. That needs to change. Cities need to invest in public health. They'll get their biggest bang for their buck that way, and they'll be able to direct resources to the people in need. Before COVID started, we talked about the fact that your zip code is often the biggest 
predictor of your health status and even your lifespan, right? And now we're starting to see this in full relief with COVID as low-income communities and people of color are being disproportionately impacted by the virus. And there's a lot of potential reasons for that. We don't know exactly why, but there could be factors at play such as, you know, rates of obesity, rates of diabetes. A lot of low-income communities struggle with air pollution, and that can actually have really damaging effects on on folks' lungs and their ability to combat the virus. And this is going to affect people of color more. I mean, Robert Samuels wrote about Milwaukee this week in The Washington Post, and he was saying that, you know, 73% of COVID deaths were Black residents, but they only make up 28% of the total county population. Like, that is staggering, and that is a terrible outcome of this. And unfortunately, yeah. we're seeing it not just in Milwaukee, but Detroit and Chicago and New Orleans. And, and we have seen folks in Milwaukee, you know, trying to fight back against this, putting together care packages for neighbors, folks who can't access grocery stores in certain neighborhoods. It is an uplifting story of community action, but it's also a really frustrating story of, of injustice, really. Yeah. And we're, we're out of time here, but I suspect we'll talk more about this story because it's not going away. Absolutely. Our next story, which is a little bit more uplifting, Dan Bertolette in Sightline penned 15 thoughts on COVID and cities. And I kind of thought it was a great compilation of a lot of themes and topics that have been coming up now. So you can kind of think of it as an urbanist guide to the crisis and the potential impacts it'll have on urban life. So, Eric, what stuck out to you from this this list of 15 thoughts? Yeah, this was a great list. I'll, I'll take housing costs for a thousand here. OK, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so Dan writes that we've got to spend less money building each new home. That is certainly true. We just saw an article today in the L.A. Times showing that in California, at least, it can cost a million dollars to create a single unit of affordable housing. Right. I think it's it's not that bad elsewhere in the country, but these costs are definitely going up. We've seen that. This is something we've looked into a lot. We think off-site construction, factory construction of housing is part of the solution, not the whole solution, but part of it. Um, because when you create housing in a factory, you can bring down the costs of that housing and you can also increase the speed of those projects, right? You can get them out there quicker. And that does a couple of things that, that really help, right? It, it means housing gets up there sooner. So you have a greater housing supply. It increases your options. Maybe it increases the number of affordable units, ultimately helps the city as a whole keep housing costs low. Um, and also by bringing down specific construction costs, you give cities a tool that they can use to create affordable housing themselves or to create new targets for developers to make affordable housing. So it, it offers a bunch of different tools that ultimately point to lower overall housing costs. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, construction is one way that you can increase supply and thus increase options for folks. But there are other ways that you can create more types of housing options, kind of more flexible housing options as well. So Dan brings up this idea of, you know, backyard cottages, mobile homes, other flexible structures that could be used now and absorb some of the shock of people who are potentially losing their homes, can't pay the rent. Maybe they're moving in with friends or our family. And that'll be helpful for quarantine populations too. Uh, Dan brings up the fact that Airbnb units, could, which are no longer really being used for short-term rentals, could now become long-term rentals. So if you're more flexible in your housing supply, that creates more options for folks. The one downside that, of course, he brings up is that a lot of towns and cities have zoning laws that kind of restrict the ability to be that flexible. Not every city allows for things like accessory dwelling units, for example. So that's one of the issues that has to be addressed if we're going to have more flexible housing options going forward. Yeah. And we've written about some of those regulatory challenges, the zoning challenges, minimum lot sizes, parking minimum requirements, single family zoning requirements. These are all things that make it harder to build housing in general and certainly more flexible housing that we need now. So I think that's a great point. You know, another thing that stood out to me was this need for pedestrian first streets. And we've talked about that in, in previous yeah. episodes here, the need for maybe closing down streets to car traffic so that pedestrians can use more of the street and keep a safe social distance. But what we haven't talked about is this concept that Sidewalks looked at, eliminating elevated curbs. A curb tells a pedestrian, you must only walk here. When you eliminate an elevated curb, you create more of the street that can be flexible to pedestrian uses at times of low traffic. 
right? And you generally improve accessibility for people using wheelchairs, for elderly populations. So I think that is another area of innovation that we could look at for cities moving forward. Mm -hmm. We don't have too much more time, but I do want to try and pick up one one other thought that Dan brings up. So he he starts talking about retail a little bit, mentioning, of course, that right now the crisis has been a huge hit to local businesses, to to street life. And, you know, it's not clear if that will change uh, in the long term. And Dan actually kind of suggests that maybe as a result of all of this, we'll just all switch to delivery and retail will just kind of go away and the ground floor will give way to uses like housing, let's say. I don't necessarily agree with that. I do think that we're going to be wanting to get back into retail stores on the ground floors of our cities. But I do agree with Dan that we're going to need more flexibility in ground floor units so that they can change easily so that they can adapt uh, to whatever the community might need. Yeah, I think this common theme here is that flexibility is resilience at a time like this. Absolutely. There's more to that list, so you should definitely check it out. We only covered a little a tip of the iceberg there. Yeah. All right. We're going to move away from COVID for our third top story of the week. And we're going to go to Wired, where Daniel Oberhaus is writing about the power plant of the future. He says it's right in your home. And he's talking about the emergence of you know renewable energy sources like solar panels, batteries, things that can work with the electricity grid to boost clean power use. So Vanessa, you've looked at this a lot, including for City of the Future. What does this future look like? I will set a little bit of context here because this is a tricky topic that can be hard to wrap your head around, as I learned trying to do that City of the Future episode. So one thing that you do have to understand is that there has been a push towards all electric neighborhoods. Now, the reason for that is that our electricity is getting cleaner and cleaner over time. So if you move to all electric neighborhood now, you're kind of setting yourself up for a greener future. And you have to start diverging away, not just from fossil fuel use, but also even things like natural gas, right? And we've been seeing a couple cities making that move already. I think Berkeley, California has even banned the use of natural gas in new construction. So th- these are important steps that cities are taking. And what it means for us as individuals or homeowners is that your home can kind of become this uh, a part of the this new clean electricity future itself, right? So that's where solar panels come in, batteries come in. You can generate clean energy at your home, store it, use it when electricity costs are potentially higher, maybe like at peak hours, you know, when the regional power grid is is more carbon intensive. Yeah. And this is kind of the point in the the Wired story. There's a community called Basalt Vista. It's an all-electric community in Colorado. Yeah. And these are homes that come with EV chargers. They come with the battery packs in the basement. And the homes are linked on this microgrid and it can distribute electricity across the neighborhood. So they don't have to rely on the the regional power grid as much, keeps things cleaner, keeps things local. And and one thing that's pretty unique about this particular community is that it's using automation to, to do this. So homes are connected to a network. It's got software that optimizes the power distribution based on where the need is. And it can even kind of automate when power goes into the grid or out of the grid. So it's it's pretty neat and unusual. Yeah. And I think what, one of the things that makes this so exciting is that it, it's keeping the costs down, right? It's keeping this greener future also an affordable future, right? We know that electricity, mm-hmm. it typically costs more than, than other types of, of energy, certainly than natural gas. So if you're going to go all electric as a community, you need to find ways to make sure that, you know, residents and businesses, their costs don't go through the roof, Because when you're using power at peak hours, when everybody else is using it, it's not only more carbon intensive, like you were saying, it costs more, right? And so this is where automation comes in, where battery storage comes in. So one example I always like to use for this that I think helps folks understand it is your dishwasher, right? And this this is not necessarily an example they're using in Colorado, but it is something we've looked at at Sidewalk Labs. So the idea is, you know, you want to run your dishwasher, but that doesn't have to happen right now. So you can set your dishwasher and the system could automatically say, you know what, you could wait till 2 a.m. and the grid will be much cleaner and the cost will be much lower. Is that okay? And you can say yes, or you can say, you know what, no, I actually do need my dishes run now. And then the system can say, oh, you know what, there's some energy, there's some battery energy in the building next door. We'll use that and we'll recharge it overnight again when the costs are low. Again, not sure they're working at that appliance level in Colorado, but it's the same idea of automation and redistribution reducing costs. And and you did see one of the residents in Colorado 
She said her electricity bills are something like $12 a month and that her annual bills are really going down. So that that is a sign that the system is working. I think that was one of the things that stood out to me from this article is the, the focus of this community on affordability, which is something that at Sidewalk we've been thinking about a lot because we know that unless these options are affordable, not just for consumers, but for the kind of infrastructure creators, it's not going to be widely adopted and we're not going to move the needle here on this greener, cleaner, green energy future, right? That said, there are a lot of challenges. We kind of talk about those in the City of the Future episode, but a lot of these traditional power grids, they are not really set up to work work well with renewable energy sources or distributed microgrids and networks. So that is a challenge and a hurdle. But as we see from this story, you know, this initiative was started by a utility. So it is possible. And it's something that will need to happen in the future if we're going to have a of a greener grid. Yeah. That is it for the top stories. As always, you can find the links to these stories in the podcast episode notes. In our next segment, we are going to talk with a colleague, Craig Neville Manning. He is the head of engineering here at Sidewalk. And we're going to talk to him about the state of the internet at a time where a lot of people are home and using it a lot. So we will be back in a sec with Craig. We are joined now by Craig Neville Manning. He's the head of engineering at Sidewalk Labs. And before Sidewalk, Craig started Google's New York office. Today, he's going to help us understand how the internet is holding up amid these extreme social distancing measures. Craig, thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Or um, nice to be there, because I guess we're all <laughs> there. <at laughs> we're all in separate locations. Exactly. Nice to be close enough. Thank you, Craig, for joining. Obviously, right now, a lot of us are depending on the internet to do our jobs, to record podcasts, to go to school, even just to socialize. I think there was a study showing internet traffic up something like 25% in some metro areas. How does the internet, how is it designed to cope with this type of surge? Interestingly, the the internet's super robust, partly because when it was designed back in the 60s, it was partly designed for the Department of Defense here in the US and was designed to be robust to all kinds of things going wrong. So actually, you know, compared to even things like the telephone system, which is robust because people spend a lot of time and effort on it, the internet is actually designed in a way to kind of, if, if some link fails or some link's overloaded, to use a different link, a different path from getting from A to B. And so in general, that the internet copes pretty well with these kinds of unusual circumstances. And, and just to understand that, how is it different from, say, the telephone infrastructure? So the internet is, is kind of a collaboration. It's a worldwide collaboration. No, no one entity runs the internet in terms of all the connections. In the same way that 30 or 40 years ago, one big company in the US, AT&T, ran the phone system. The internet's this collaboration. And that collaboration, because there are lots of different players and they, ha- they had to figure out how to work together, it actually creates this level of robustness because there's, there's no single point of failure. Got it. Can you explain why individual connections could be poor, even though overall, as you're saying, the, the internet infrastructure is, is pretty robust? You know, we've suddenly been thrust into a situation where you imagine a, a family of four where the two kids, instead of being at school, are actually doing all of their schooling online, you know, over video conferencing, et cetera. Maybe somebody's, you know, streaming uh, Netflix in, uh, in another room. Uh, maybe somebody's on a video conference call. Suddenly the infrastructure at home in somebody's apartment and somebody's house that was just fine before now has like four simultaneous, pretty bandwidth heavy, heavy applications going on. Mm-hmm. And it's not so much that the internet's breaking, is that their home may or may not, and, and the town they live in may or may not, have the same kind of, of internet infrastructure that an urban core might have had. And it depends if, for example, uh, a company has run fiber to homes or whether they're still using DSL, which is, a, is an access uh, method that runs over old copper uh, telephone cables. So you're, you're kind of bringing up something that I'm I'm particularly interested in right now, which is this idea of that not everybody's internet connection is equal, right? And mm-hmm. I think even before COVID, we were aware that the digital divide is real. But now with the outbreak, people are staying home and being asked oftentimes to work or learn from home, which is really complicated if you don't have a strong internet connection. Um, we have heard about some interesting solutions or temporary solutions. Like I think in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there actually driving Wi-Fi hotspots to certain neighborhoods that don't have great connections. But I mean, what do you think is the best way that cities can start addressing the digital divide right now? First off, I I agree that it's a huge issue. As you said, 
we've been concerned about this before this happened, but now if your ability to get good quality education depends on having a good broadband internet connection, things have just got a lot worse for, for a whole bunch of people who, who don't have broadband at home, for example. I think the, the stopgap that you mentioned is a good one, using essentially wireless broadband as a, as a substitute for wide broadband. When we think about the long, long term, um, uh, I think we should take a different approach to the way that we provide internet in cities. When I think about how much hassle it is to set up an internet router or a, another Wi-Fi access point, it drives me a little crazy, and I consider myself you know, fairly decent at this. <laughs> it's kind of crazy that we expect everybody, regardless of their background or technical proficiency, to become a network administrator for their <laughs> apartment. I honestly think it would be better if cities had more infrastructure that just blanketed the city with Wi-Fi, provided it to everybody. We'd have to figure out how to pay for it, but, but managing on a more professional level, on a more scalable level, I think would would end up with everybody being better off and, you know, people not having to be their own network administrators, which would I think would be better. Last one for you, Craig, and we'll let you go. We're talking about COVID, but kind of looking more broadly, even if the internet is holding up now, we're always trying to improve it. I know that's something Sidewalk has looked into. What do you think internet infrastructure might look like? How might it change in the future? I think one big area is around security and people worry about security of their devices in their apartment. And we're getting more and more devices right? as, as a lot of the thermostats and other gadgets become internet connected. The way we approach security right now is with something called a firewall, which is essentially built into most routers that you get from your internet service provider. But that kind of a, a blunt instrument. There's something called a software defined network that I'm pretty excited about because it really allows you to communicate with all the devices that you own and for nobody else to really get access to those. It's a much more secure approach and it relies much less, again, on this idea that you in your own apartment are your network administrator and have to manage your firewall, which I can't even do right and uh, and I suspect most people can't. And so I think that's an exciting area and it's going to become more and more important as more and more of our devices get connected to the internet, which is great and convenient, but also opens up some security holes. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Craig. It was really interesting to learn about the the current and future state of the internet here. Right. The thing keeping us up right now. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all the best with your connectivity. Thank you, Craig. (laughs) And it is now time for our final segment, The Last Smile. This is a segment where we set aside the depressing news of the week and we focus on something happy for a minute each. Eric, what made you smile? So I'm going to go with a a story that's really a picture story in Bloomberg, written by Laura Millen Lombrana and Eric Rostin. They're showing all these pictures of animals who are kind of reclaiming urban environments, right? During the lockdown, people are in their homes and the animals... You know, are reclaiming these areas. You've got mountain goats walking single file down a sidewalk in Wales. You've got this really ornate, colorful peacock strolling through a plaza in Dubai, which is just kind of perfectly fitting. <laughs> you know, I think my favorite was you had these two deer. They're, they're walking up to a sushi place in a Japanese city and they're looking in the window and, and they're looking at the proprietor and they're like, come on, buddy, you're usually open right now. And so, so I think that was uh, kind of my favorite one. I, I liked the uh, the puma in Santiago. I mean, I, I used to live there and some of my friends had actually sent me videos of pumas crossing the street in yeah. neighborhoods where I used to go. I was just so shocked. It's really and it's so quick, too. This is what's so remarkable. It only took like two days or something in lockdown for these animals to start kind of reclaiming the space that was once theirs, you know, pretty fascinating. It makes you wonder uh, when all this is done, if we can share our space a little better. <laughs> Maybe not with Pumas. Maybe not. I think we still need social distancing with Pumas, (laughs) Eric. (laughs) All right. I think you've got an animal theme as well here. What made you smile? I do, well, you know, animals are just keeping the internet going, keeping us happy these these weeks. So yes, um, I saw an article in the Washington Post by Antonia Nori Farzan, and she was profiling a, a special little animal at the Stonehouse Urban Winery in Hagerstown, Maryland. So people... They're staying at home. They're drinking a lot of wine, but they want to get their wine safely. And so they are driving to the store and the winery has trained their dog. It's a pup named Soda Pup. Soda Pup. 
not soda pop, soda pup. Um, and soda pup has figured out how to get the delivery of wine bottles to people's cars. You know, it took a little training. She ha- she's not 100 percent there yet. But uh, as you can see in the video, but she's trying and people are very happy about it. And the public service announcement, you know, dogs can carry the virus, but it's experts aren't too concerned about it, really. So people can still give some love to soda pup as they get their wine delivery. I was really impressed how Soda Pup was able to kind of swipe their credit cards. You know, it, was, it was really impressive. Without opposable thumbs, you know, you can do so much. <laughs> All right, folks, time is up. Thank you for joining us this week. If you want to read the stories that we discussed today and many more, you should sign up for the Sidewalk Weekly newsletter at SidewalkLabs.com. As always, we should note that the views expressed in the Sidewalk Weekly don't necessarily reflect Sidewalk's company position. And if you think that we're missing a perspective, let us know. Send us an email, send us a voice memo to podcast at SidewalkLabs.com. We might just talk about it in a future episode. The Sidewalk Weekly is produced by Vanessa and me. Vanessa does the editing. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. And our art is by the great Tim Cow. We'll see you next time. Bye.